Welcome again to Dimensions of Prophecy and tonight's subject, Seven Steps to Feeling Great. God wants you to feel good, but there are a lot of people who have the misconception that God wants them to feel bad. As you follow along with Pastor Kenneth Cox tonight, you'll find that God indeed wants you to feel good, and he gives you great insight on the topic of feeling good right here in the scripture. Often we meet people whose Christian experience is not a happy one, Yet Jesus clearly said he came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. Tonight's presentation will be a great blessing to you. Let's join Pastor Cox now with his health-giving, mind-soothing lecture, Seven Steps to Feeling Great. Good evening. Very happy to see each of you back again tonight. Tonight our subject is Seven Steps to feeling great. You see, God wants us to feel good. God never intended that people should feel bad. Just didn't want us to be that way. Every wise, fastidious car owner knows that if his car is going to operate as it should, if it's going to give him the service that he needs, he knows that there are certain things that you have to do. He knows that you've got to put gas in it, at least ought to know that. He also knows that you've got to keep air in the tires, that you need to check the oil, the water in the battery. He knows that there are certain things that has to be done if that car is going to operate, if it's going to give him the service that he needs. But this same wise, fastidious car owner will go right on through life and pay no attention whatsoever to the human machinery until he has to be hauled into some medical garage for repair. And tonight, there are literally thousands of medical garages that are full of human wrecks because they didn't do anything until the motor started knocking. They're just things that an individual must do if he's going to be healthy, if he's going to be happy. God wants each one of us to be that way. Now, you see, when God created man and made him, God made him in a very, very special way. In the book of Psalm, it says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and what? wonderfully made, marvelous are your works, that my soul knows very well. So when God made man, he made him in a very marvelous way. You ever taken some time just to study the human body, anatomy? Have you ever stopped to consider that you see things in color? What if you only saw things in black and white? You ever stop to consider the human ear? Something as simple as the human ear. Did you know, well, all of you know that when a baby's born, well, uh, it grows. We expect it to, the bones grow and all that. But in your ear, right in the middle, in layman's terms, there's a couple little bones called the hammer and the anvil. Those are completely developed when you're born. It takes a matter of hours for them to harden. And the baby can hear. You see, how do you explain that? When David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that my soul knows very well. God has made us in a marvelous way. He didn't intend. When God created you, created each one of us, he didn't intend for us to die. God intended for man to live through eternity. He didn't intend for him to die at all. And even when sin came in, it still took a long time before man died. In fact, the scripture says that Adam lived to be 930 years old. And let me tell you right now, that 930 years is like our years. There were 360 days in their years, and he lived to be 930 years old. And his son, 
Seth lived to be 912 years old. Methuselah, oldest man, 969 years. Noah, 950 years old. Tremendous ages that they lived. And then by the time we reach Abraham, man's age has dropped to 175 years. That's how old Abraham lived to be. By the way, did you know that you only have the lifespan of two individuals from creation to Abraham? Did you know that? That's all. You've got the lifespan of two men from creation to Abraham, Adam and Noah. That's it. Over 1,800 years, in fact, 1,880 years in those two men's lives takes you almost down to the time of Abraham. And by the time we reach David, and by the way, the Scripture said about Abraham that lived to be 175 years old and died at a good old age. 175 is not too good compared to 930, is it? 175, and by the time you reach David, it says the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength there are 80 years, Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So today, if a person lives to be 70 years old, he's done pretty well. If by the grace of God he makes 80, they say, well, he's done very well. But even a person that lives to be 70, 80 years old, God didn't intend for us to be unhealthy. He intended for us to enjoy life. He wants us to have health. It says, Beloved, I prosper that, excuse me, beloved, I pray that you may prosper in what? All things. By the way, let me just pause here. I run on to people that bother me because they want to think that God also wants you to be poor. God doesn't want you to be poor. Whoever told you that? He says that he wished that you might prosper and be in what? Health, just as your soul prospers. He said, I want you to be healthy. I want you to enjoy life. God doesn't want you to be sick. I actually know people that they think that if you feel good, there's something wrong with you. No. In fact, this is what it promises. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. God says that if we will serve him, if we'll do what he wants us to do, he'll take sickness away from the midst of us. Promises that. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be what? Added unto you. Do you know what all those things are? Have you ever stopped and read what all those things are? It's in the same chapter. It talks about your food. It talks about your shelter. It talks about your clothing. That's what he, when he says all these things, that's what he's talking about. And it says that he wants us to be healthy, wants us to be happy. And let me tell you right now, dear friends, a lot of that has to do with how you think. A lot of people that aren't happy because they don't think right. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to tell you here you can think your way into heaven. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if your relationship is right with the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll think right. That's what I'm saying. It says clearly here, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they might have it more what? abundantly. I see Christian people that have faces like donkeys. You know, they're not happy. Dear friend, let me tell you something. If you understand salvation, if you understand Jesus Christ, it is going to make you happy. It ought to make you sing in the shower. Whether you can sing or not is not the question. It ought to put joy in your soul. He came to give you life and to give it to you 
more abundantly. That's how he came to give us life. And if you aren't enjoying your belief and if you don't enjoy your relationship to Jesus Christ, then there's something wrong. You need to take a close look because you're not understanding something. Because it should make you happy. He came to give us life, to give it to us more abundantly. Now, these bodies of ours, we're meeting here in this church. This church is a place where a group of Christians can meet, but it's not the temple of God. Your body is God's temple. That's what it says. Your body is God's temple. And it says here, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Our bodies belong to him. When I come and I give myself to the Lord Jesus Christ, my body becomes his temple. It becomes the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Dwells in us. There abides in us. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him, for the temple of God is what? Holy, which temple you are. Why is your body God's temple and why is it holy? What makes it holy? Oh, if I do certain things and I walk circumspectly and I don't do anything wrong, then maybe my body will be holy. Right? Huh? What makes it holy? The presence of God. That's what makes it holy. And when the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells in you, your body becomes his temple and your body is holy because it's the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. It says that I am not to defile it. I must understand that it is the temple of God and I must treat my body as best I can. Now, God gives us some very clear advice about how we ought to treat our bodies. He's given us some very simple things to help us to be healthy. One is air, fresh air. God's given us fresh air. Now, I know here in Southern California, you have to <laughs> go out and look for it sometimes. Or, and I shouldn't say... <laughs> It's kind of hard to find sometimes. But nevertheless, you need to get outside and get some fresh air. God gave that to us, and it is what you need to help you be healthy. You see, there are certain organs in your body that the health of those organs are dependent upon your breathing, how you breathe. Those organs happen to be your lungs, your heart, and your kidneys. And you let any one of those get in trouble and the others get in trouble. If you've got heart trouble, you better believe you're going to have lung problems and kidney problems. If you've got kidney problems, you're going to have heart problem and lung problems. They go together. And the health of those, to a large degree, depends on your breathing. I'm going to share with you how to breathe. It may sound crazy, may sound funny, but it works, okay? You have a muscle down here called the diaphragm. It's the largest muscle there is there, and it has to do with your breathing, and some people never use theirs because they don't breathe any deeper than about here. If you want to breathe right, then just pretend that your legs are hollow. And as you walk, Try to suck the air up through your legs. And I'll guarantee you it'll pull it right down here where it belongs. Now, if you haven't had any down there for 20 or 30 years, it might cause you to cough a little bit, but you'll get over it, okay? But just learn to breathe right. It has a lot to do with it. I'm just going to share some very simple things with you. 
another thing that you need if you want to be healthy, and that is you need sunshine. It's needed. You need to get out and get in the sunshine. You know how we are. We live in air-conditioned houses, and we go out and get in our air-conditioned car, and we drive to our air-conditioned office, and we work there, and we get back in our air-conditioned car, and we drive back to our air-conditioned homes, and then we wonder what's wrong with us. You need to get out and get some sunshine. I'm not telling you to go out and become beachcombers. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. But you need to get outside. You need to get some sunshine. It's necessary if you're going to be healthy. Also, I'm just telling you simple things that God has given you that can make a great difference in your life. Third thing is that of water. You need, and when I'm talking about water, I'm not talking about water on the outside. All of you went to school, you were all taught hygiene, and you know good and well if you don't practice basic hygiene, you're not going to be healthy. You know that. So I don't need to talk about water on the outside. I'm talking about water on the inside. If you're going to be healthy, you better drink some water. About six to eight glasses a day. And I know what some of you are saying. You're saying, I don't even drink one. Well, okay, it's all right. But when you start suffering from different things, you'll wish you had drunk more water. You need to drink water. Take the time to drink it, folks. It'll make a great, great difference in your life. God put it there. It'll help you stay healthy. Another thing is that of exercise. You see, you're not going to be healthy if you don't exercise. You need to get out and get some exercise, and it really doesn't take a great lot. In fact, a few minutes a day will keep you in good shape. There's two things that are necessary if that exercise is going to do you any good. One, it must make you breathe hard. Two, it must make you sweat. You understand me? Now, I could have said perspire, but you probably wouldn't have understood that. <laughs> got to make you perspire. It's got to make you sweat. Those two things are necessary if it's really going to do you some good. And I can tell you, standing in front of the TV set and doing this with Jack LaLanne won't do it. <laughs> You're going to have to get out, get some exercise, probably about 15, 20 minutes a day, the very best exercise there is, is walking. And you ought to walk about three miles a day. You ought to get out, you ought to walk about three miles a day. You say, oh, Brother Cox, I don't have time. I can't walk three miles a day. I'm too busy. I don't have time to do that. Well, if you can't walk, run. <laughs> but you need to get some exercise. If you're going to be healthy, it's important. Another thing is that simply of sleep. Sleep is a very strange commodity, whatever you want to call it. Some people need 10 hours a day. Some people need eight hours. Some people get by beautifully on six hours. You know yourself. You know how much you need. You need to get the amount of sleep that's necessary for you for you to function well. That's what you need. Scientists have found that all of us are born with a certain amount of what is called vital force. You're born with a certain amount, and you cannot add to that. In other words, there's no way for you to add to vital force. All you do through your life is subtract. You subtract from it. When you use it all up, that's it. You're gone. You can subtract great big hunks from it by burning the candle on both ends. Okay, so get the rest that you need. 
Now, most of you are saying, well, that's all nice and that's lovely. The next part is what people really don't like. That has to do with diet. You know, talk about anything you want to, but boy, don't talk about what I'm going to eat. <laughs> you know, don't, don't bother me there. Well, the Lord has quite a bit to say about what we eat. In fact, he says this, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, what he's saying there is there's two types of people. There's some people that eat to live, and there's some people that live to eat. Great, great difference in the American people are without question the strangest of all of them. I really don't understand it. I don't know what we have done. I've tried to figure it out. I really kind of would like to blame the high chair. I really think maybe that's the problem. You know, when the baby's small, we put the baby in the high chair and we put this tray in front of them, and then we put the food on it, and that baby sits there and winds that up and squashes it and sticks it in their mouth. And we grow up thinking that anything we can get our hands on, we can put in our mouths. Just isn't the way it is, folks. God says some very clear things about what we eat and what we should not eat. Makes it real clear. In fact, probably one of the greatest lessons that I ever learned in my life was in grade school. I went to a little country school way back in the sticks. Now, folks, there's no way for you to comprehend what I came out of. And there's some dear people that have labored with me for years over my language. And I have all the appreciation in the world for them. In fact, I didn't know I had a problem until I went away to school, and then I went home and I understood what was wrong with me. Uh, you know, uh, but I went to this little country school way out here in the sticks, and I can remember one time we went to town on a weekend, got there, and here were signs up all over saying the circus was coming to town. And, uh, of course, when we got back to school, all of us kids played circus. You know, we talked about the circus and played circus. I don't know what happened to that circus, but somehow it got lost and it wound up on this dirt road way back in the woods where our school was. Don't ask me how it got there. But Reuben Hatter was standing there at the pencil sharpener sharpening his pencil when that circus started by. And he yelled, the circus, and man, all of us were out of our seats with our nose plastered against the glass looking at the circus. It went by. And pretty soon this truck went by with these elephants on it. And we looked around, and we had a man teacher, and he was sitting in his desk, and we said, come look at these elephants. Have you ever seen anything like that? And he just sat there at his desk. And pretty soon another truck went by with lions on it. We said, look at these lions. Come here. He didn't move. And pretty soon a truck went by with giraffes on it, and we said, look at those things. That's the longest necks I've ever seen. Come look at this. He didn't budge. The circus went by. We all went back to our seats. And we said to him, why wouldn't you come look at the circus? Why didn't you come look at the animals? And in a very quiet voice, he said to us, sometime in life, everybody ought to learn to control themselves. <laughs> and when it comes to eating, we ought to learn to control ourselves, folks. Listen to what God says in the book of Leviticus. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. Now, I might as well take care of something right here because every time I read that, somebody comes to me and says, Brother Cox, that was written for the Jew. That was written for the Israelite because it says, speak unto the children of Israel. Bless your hearts, the 
only difference that I know between my stomach and a Jew's stomach is mine might be a little bigger. That's the only difference I know. Okay? So let's settle that. He said, these are the animals that you shall eat. Among the beast, whatever divides the hoof. Catching it? He's telling you what you can eat. Whatever divides the hoof. Having cloven hoofs, that means it splits the hoof. And chewing the cud, that you may eat. So it says it has to have two characteristics. It has to chew the cud. It has to divide the hoof, be cloven footed. All right. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among the, those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves, the camel because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it's unclean to you. God said, don't eat the camel. The rock, hyrac, if you don't understand what a hyrac is, that's a badger. I don't know why they want to use those words, but anyhow. Because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it's unclean to you, so you're not to eat the rock badger. The hare, that happens to be the rabbit. Getting a little closer to home, aren't we? Because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, it's unclean to you. God said, don't eat it. The swine or the pig, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. So God says, since it doesn't chew the cud, don't eat it. So for an animal to be clean, God just simply says it must chew the cud. You know what chewing the cud is, don't you? Huh? Yes. You've driven, seen an old cow just standing there chewing the cud. That's what it's talking about. All right. It's got to chew the cud. It's got to divide the hoof, be cloven-footed. The animal must have those two characteristics. When it comes to sea life, God says concerning the animals, their flesh you shall not eat, their carcass you shall not touch, they're unclean to you. When it comes to sea life, God again gives two characteristics. These you may eat of all that are in the waters, whatever in the waters has fins and scales, whether in the sea or in the rivers, that you may eat. Two characteristics, got to have fins and scales. Simply what he says. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water, or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. So God says if they don't have fins and scales, don't eat them. That means such things as bass, trout, tuna, halibut, perch. Those are clean. It means such things as catfish, crab, oysters, lobsters, they're unclean, not to be eaten. They're scavengers. God made him to clean up the bottom of the ocean and the ponds and the rivers, and he said, leave them alone. When it comes to the birds, there are birds. God doesn't give us a rule. He gives a rule on the animals. He gives a rule on the fish, but he doesn't give you a rule on the birds. He just names them. He says the hawk and the kite and the cuckoo and the cormorant and the pelican and the lapwing and the bat, and he names them. And all that he names are birds of prey. He says, leave them alone. Don't eat them. It's not hard. And really, when you take a look at them, there's not really... A very inviting list. You know, when you take a look at those that were not to eat, I don't find the best restaurants serving them. I don't ho find people going in and saying, I'd like, you know, a camel steak or the breast of, of seagull or breaded mouse. I, I don't find people ordering that stuff. He says that it must have it must chew the cud, it must divide the hoof, or it must have fins and scales, or listed as being clean far as the birds are concerned. And God says, those you can eat, leave the others alone. Really, I run on to people that worship all kinds of things, 
I find people that worship money. I find people worship cars. There's some people that worship pigs. You know, I, I, I visit with people and I preach about this. I remember a little old lady, I preached on it and went to visit her one day and she said, oh, Brother Cox, I can't do that. And I said, what do you mean you can't do that? And she said, I wouldn't have anything to season my beans with. Now, God just simply says, leave it alone. How many of you have ever heard of rattlesnake hunts? You ever heard of rattlesnake hunts? Over in Oklahoma, they have a lot of rattlesnake hunts. Well, I shouldn't say a lot. They have one in Okeen, Oklahoma. It's probably the biggest in the nation. It's a publicity thing, you know. They used to have a lot of rattlesnake hunts in the state of Wyoming. And the reason they had them is because the rattlesnakes there in the spring when the snow all melted, those rattlesnakes would come out and would sun on the rocks and they were striking the cattle and killing them. And so they were having rattlesnake hunts trying to lower the rattlesnake population. They don't hardly have any rattlesnake hunts in the state of Wyoming today. They solved their problem. You know how they solved their problem? Every spring, before they turn the cattle out, they turn out herds of pigs. The pigs go through and eat up the rattlesnakes. The rattlesnake can strike a pig time and time again. It won't affect that pig at all. That pig has more poison in its body than the rattlesnake does. And so the pig eats the rattlesnake and then we eat the pig. No, God said, leave it alone. It's unclean not to be eaten. He didn't make them to be eaten. People say, well, what do you think he created it for? He created it for a garbage disposal. That's what he made it for. And God says, leave it alone. Uh, you know, we're not hurting for things to eat, folks. Really, when you stop and think about it, we've got a lot of good things to eat. In fact, Jesus even talking about when he's coming back had this to say about it. Listen to what it says here in Isaiah. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord judge all flesh and the slain of the Lord shall be many. This is describing the coming of Jesus Christ. That's what that text is talking about. Now listen to the next text. Verse 17. Those who sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go to the gardens after an idol in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination, the abomination is talking about the fish that are unclean, and the mounts shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. He said, leave them alone, don't eat them. Now we, you know, what I'm trying to say is, so often, we say, does it really make any difference? Yes, it does. It makes a difference because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's where he dwells. We've got a lot of good things to eat. And if we'll eat those, we can certainly be much, much healthier, much, much happier. Now, I'm going to touch two or three things very quickly. I'm not going to spend much time on it, but it's important. In the book of Deuteronomy, it gives us some real good counsel. Deuteronomy 29, verse 18 says, So that there may not be among you a man or a woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Listen carefully and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. Now, if you want to take your Bible, and your Bible has a center margin in it, and you want to look up that text in Deuteronomy 29, you'll find by that word wormwood or bitterness, you'll find a little number. And if you look it up in the center margin, it'll say poisonous herb says that if there's somebody that wants to use a poisonous herb, this is what God says about it. And so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blessed himself in his heart saying, 
I shall have peace even though I walk in the imagination of my heart as though the drunkard could be included with the sober. The Lord would not spare him, for then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man, and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him, and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven. That is strong, strong words. And he says that you and I are not to take a poisonous herb into our body. That's what he's saying. He says we're not to do that. In fact, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, it says that they brought to him a poisonous herb. It says very clearly, they gave him sour wine mingled with what? Gall. That's a poisonous herb to drink. And when he tasted it, he would not drink. He said, no, I won't drink it. He refused it. Now, a lot of us, even as young people, got started taking a poisonous herb into our body in the form of tobacco. Tobacco is an insidious poison, extremely hard on you. In fact, tobacco itself has 18 poisons in it. Nicotine being the worst. God says, don't use it. Leave it alone. And I know what you're talking about. When I was nine years old, we moved from Chicago, Illinois, to Oklahoma. And I enrolled in school in this little country school that I was telling you about. And I'll probably make some statements that the rest of you won't understand here, but there may be some of you that will. Started in school there, recess came, and all the boys went down behind the coal house. Now, some of you don't know what I'm talking about when I say that. But I went to a little old school where the only heat there was in the school was a pot belly stove in the corner. And so they had a coal house down on the end of the playgrounds where you got the coal for the stove. And all the boys went down behind the coal house and Paul Klein pulled out a hunk of twist tobacco. I don't know if you know what twist tobacco is. But they take the tobacco leaf and they roll it. And after they got it rolled up, they fold it in half and then they twist it and it's dried that way. I mean, it's pure stuff. And he took a great big bite off of it handed it to the next boy, and he took a bite, and they handed it right on around, and it came to me, and I took a bite of it. And by the time recess was over, I was purple. <laughs> I mean, I was sick. When in the schoolroom, these kids had chewed tobacco so long that they didn't even spit it out. They just stuck it in the cheek and left it there. We were sitting there. I had my head down on the desk. I was so sick, and Mrs. Lewis, our teacher, she looked over there at Reuben Hatter, and she said, Reuben, are you chewing? And he went, no, ma'am. Boy, that's all I could take. I raised my hand and said, can I go home? I'm sick. And I went home. The next day, I came back to school, and recess came, and they all went down behind the coal house. And I didn't have enough sense not to go. And I went down there, and they all apologized. They said, we're sorry. We knew that would make you sick. They said, so when school was out last night, we went to town, and we bought you some beech nut tobacco. And they started me on beech nut. And I chewed beech nut tobacco all the way through grade school, started smoking when I got into high school. And so I know what I'm talking about. I know the effects of it. I know what it does to you. I know it's not easy to quit. I know it's habit forming. I know it's addicting. I'm well acquainted with that. But let me tell you something. When I gave my heart to Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and the Holy Spirit came into my life and my body became his temple, I gave that to the Lord. And God expects you and I 
to give it to him, to give it up, because our bodies are his temple. Now, as I said, I can't spend much time here. And this is one area that I'd get on a hobby horse if I'm not careful. And that has to do with taking pills. It bothers me when I hear parents tell their kids, you know, don't use crack, leave the speed alone, stay off the marijuana, and don't misunderstand me, you young people. I don't believe in that stuff. But it bothers me when parents tell their kids to leave it alone and then they go into the bathroom and get their legalized dope out of the medicine cabinet. That bothers me. And don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. When here in the United States we use 50 million tranquilizers every day. Don't tell me I don't. Just because a doctor will write you a prescription for it doesn't make it right. Write it down. That thing of taking that kind of stuff and doing what we're doing to our bodies is an absolute shame to God. And don't take what I'm saying to mean that I don't believe in doctors. I do. But I can tell you, if your doctor never has time to talk with you, all he ever wants to do is stick you with a needle and give you another pill, you probably ought to find another doctor. That I am telling you. Your body is perfectly capable of recuperating. It's capable of healing itself if you and I will give it a chance. And that does concern me. But let me move on. I don't want to spend much time on that. Proverbs 23, verse 1 says, Do not look on wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At last it biteth like a serpent and stings like an viper and dear friend don't let anybody tell you oh it's perfectly all right to drink socially they don't know what socially means i can tell you right now when it comes to alcohol the only kind of temperance there is is total abstinence and all you got to do is walk with me a few places that i've been and it doesn't take you very long to see the results of alcohol this idea of saying, well, it won't hurt me to drink a little of it. Dear friend, yes, it will hurt you. There'd be some of you that would be much better off if you went out here and got a speeding ticket and had to go to school to hear what they had to say about alcohol and driving. You might wake up. The Bible doesn't place its blessing on drinking. In fact, it says this. Wine is a mocker, intoxicating. Drink arouses brawling, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. If you want to be stupid, okay. But dear friend, recognize if you're going to drink it, you're stupid. You ought to sense that. God doesn't place his blessing on it. And I find people taking the scripture and trying to rationalize the use of alcohol. No, and don't try to quote me dr Greek as a defense for it. It is not. Christ didn't use it, and he doesn't expect us to use it where you should leave it alone. It's not healthy, it's not good for you, and God doesn't want you using it. There's too many people that have wrecked their lives by trying to use it. Jesus came to give us freedom, in fact, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the what? The captives. Dear friend, I want to tell you tonight, if you're a captive, if you're a captive to alcohol, the Lord came to deliver you. If you're a captive to tobacco, to nicotine, the Lord came to deliver you. If you're a captive to drugs, the Lord came to deliver you. Promises that. He came to set you free. He wants you to be free. He wants you to be happy. He wants your body to be his temple. And I hope tonight you'll just come and place everything in the hands of Jesus Christ.